Hi, I'm Ahmed okay. Yathmash from the Arab Parent Manual. <clears throat> I'm with uh, three remarkable young Sudanese people. Um, the first is Hatem Ajayl, uh, a young Sudanese American citizen journalist who's been chronicling the, the uprising from the early days. Um, you should check out his timeline on Reddit or on the Arab Parent Manual website if you haven't seen it already. Uh, the second is Bayan Abu Bakr, uh, a scholar of Sudanese history at Princeton University studying anti-blackness and state formation. And the third is the inimitable Khalid al -Bih, the Sudanese cartoonist extraordinaire. Um, and we're going to start with Hatem. Uh, sorry, Hatem, because you've just been uh, talking <laughs> off it and you're not going to have to do it again. Um, so can you give us like a brief rundown from the early days of the revolution, how it broke out, what happened until today? Yeah, absolutely. So I believe in early December, the Omar al-Bashir's regime, the former president, lifted bread subsidies, which had an IMF recommendation, which led to a tripling in bread prices throughout the country. There were many, many protests, which until, you know, December 19th, where we saw these protests in the city of Adbara lead to the burning of ruling party headquarters. The kind of footage of that uprising sparked nationwide protests that switched immediately from economic demands to demands for the downfall of Omar al-Bashir's regime. The Sudanese Professionals Association eventually came in and began organizing these protests, coordinating the revolution. On, in January, the Forces of Freedom and Change, a coalition of opposition movements, which included the Sudanese Professionals Association, made the Declaration of Freedom and Change proposing basically what, what type of governance would follow Omar al-Bashir's regime, which was civilian governance that was supposed to rule for a four-year transitional period where they would pursue economic and legal reform, as well as prosecute members of the former regime. Uh, on April 6th, the FFC and the SPA coordinated the Millions March, a massive, massive ma nationwide protest, which culminated in a sit-in in front of military headquarters in Khartoum. That sit-in continued until April 11th, where the Sudanese people got the news that Omar al-Bashir's regime had been overthrown by the military, and a transitional government was formed, which we now call the Transitional Military Council, or the TMC. However, despite Omar al-Bashir's overthrow, protests continued, the sit-in continued, as the FFC insisted upon civilian governance, as opposed to uh, mil a military transitional period. The military and the FFC eventually entered into negotiations to see if they could come to an agreement over how transitional governments would go down, essentially. And that and those negotiations were hotly contentious, met with tons and tons of roadblocks, and they eventually just died on June 3rd after rapid support forces massacred protesters in the at the military HQ sit-in. So this whole time that um, the forces of freedom and change had been negotiating transitional uh, government uh, led by civilians with the military council, it turns out that the military council wasn't intending to go along with this the whole time. They, they were just buying time to do what military regimes typically do. That's definitely the general, that's definitely the general perception that I would agree, that I would agree with. Some people blame the FFC and the type of demands it was making. I don't. So yeah, it seems to me that ultimately the military, because what's happening right now in Sudan is also a revolutionary a revolution against military hegemony in the country which has been in place since 1958 the military ultimately doesn't want to lose power it'll have a civilian government under its supervision but it'll never really leave power so i'd agree that's accurate and bayan you've just been in sudan you only just came back um, yeah were you in khartoum yeah, I was in Khartoum. I was um, in between Bahri and Khartoum and Umdurman, so kind of in between the three major cities in the state of Khartoum. And what's what's the sentiment? What are people are coming? Uh, um, I think it's really mixed, and it was always really hard to get like a full temperature check. But I think like 
right before the massacre, like the air in Sudan, like I'd never felt that sort of air before. Like it's the air, like I feel like my parents talked about and that existed in like my parents' memories and in the parents of those who longed for an old Sudan because Al-Qiyada, like the Syrian was just such an exclusionary an ex- inclusionary and welcoming and radical space that I had just, I'd never seen Sudan in that sort of light. And I think that sort of energy was infectious I and mean, you felt it all over the city and you felt people like speak and like exist with a sense of hope. Um, and so then like, then the morning of the massacre, June 3rd, I think is when everybody, be, like around 6 a.m. is when everybody became alerted to what was happening um, at the sit-in when at least 10,000 rapid support forces gathered around the sit-in and just opened fire, um, started raping and killing indiscriminately, um, throwing bodies in the Nile. Like it just, and it was the first day of Eid uh, as well. So it was just, um, I think, really shocking. I think people had had a sense that something like this was going to happen because of the way things were escalating. But I don't think anybody sort of expected that it, it would reach this level of, um, violence. Um, so the air was very sad. Like, I think people, there's still hope that people exist with. And I, I mean, we see that now with protests erupting again. And like, there's demands for um, a march on June 30th, a major march by the SBA on June 30th. So it's people obviously are like, there's so much resilience um, in everything that's going to happen. And, and in the feeling that's in Sudan right now and in Khartoum. But I think it's, there's just a layer of sadness and a layer of like existential dread at like the, the what we're really facing um, because rapid support forces um, who are backed by Saudi and Nui at that um, have just really demonstrated that they're not willing to give up um, their seat to power easily. So I think the, the, the weight of the battle ahead is like sort of lingers on in Khartoum. Yeah, it brought tears to my eyes when you were describing the atmosphere at the military HQ sitting because yeah. I remember that moment in Libya where you know, people saw their country in a whole new light. Um, yeah. And like people who were raised in an atmosphere where you know anybody could be a spy who's reporting to the regime, uh, yeah. you live in fear, you live in fear, and suddenly you know your neighbors again, and you can just be friendly with people in the street, yeah. and everyone is a fellow countryman. And I, you know, everyone followed that moment as it happened in Egypt, uh, that moment as it happened in Syria, yeah. and that moment was crushed in every single country. Yeah, no, and it's like a sense of camaraderie that I think only exists in those sorts of spaces. Like just walking on the street and hearing somebody say like Madania or like calling you Kandaka and referring mm-hmm. to Sudanese women, it just like felt so like we're all in this together. Like it's just, and so they really robbed us of that. Yeah, and um, despite so many lessons being learned by the Sudanese people who organized incredibly well, um, mm-hmm. I don't, nobody expected how well the uprising would be coordinated and how much they would have learned from uh, the experiences of neighboring countries, yeah. um, but the people in charge followed the exact same playbook, which was um, completely failed to show any kind of alternative vision, failed yeah. to get on the, you know, on, on the on the boat and just um, crack down as hard as possible, and even if it means destroying your country, and of course taking money from the Gulf, the counter-revolutionary Axis, um, who are determined to stamp out um, any kind of signs of democracy and uh, human rights uh, normalization anywhere in the region. Um, Khaled, you've written uh, really poignantly about this kind of loss of faith that people have been experiencing and and the sensation of despair over the last few weeks since the attack on the military HQ sit-in. Can you tell me more about, like, describe what you've written, first of all, and explain it a bit more? well, for, you know, first of all, I, I, I don't normally write. I, I draw and I, I, I suck at writing, but I really didn't know what else to do because um, since since the beginning of the uprising in, 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 in January, and I was there since November, you know, until mid-January and when things were heating up. And then, you know, p- people weren't realizing that how strong this is. And then when it actually started to happen, and 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 Bashir was out of power in, in April. People got so, you know, it was it's just like Bayan said, it was a whole new country, it was a whole new spirit. Everybody smelled mm-hmm. finally freedom, you know. Mm-hmm. And for me, you know, I've I've most people know me for my work because of the Arab Spring. You know, I've 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 been working and you know, I did a lot of work about Egypt, a lot of work about Tunisia, a lot of work about Syria, a lot of work about Yemen. So I've seen this happen before, you know, and, and, and I was so, I was so, I was terrified about seeing it happen again at home. But of course, in the fears of being, you know, being a pessimist, I was like, oh, you know, we're going to do, you're going to do better with, there's going to be, you know, it's going to turn into a, uh, we know what happened. We've seen what happened. This is going to be different. 
But um, at the end of the day, as you said, it's the same. It's the same playbook, and um, there there was no way around it. Really, like the way I look at it, it was these 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 things were planned to happen that way. I mean, you know, even before the the the, the brutal uh, uh, crackdown on the sit the sit in, Burhan and Hamiti went and visit these exact countries and came mm-hmm. back with a totally different tone. Before that, it was more like, yes, we're negotiating, we're trying to, they were trying to buy time basically to, to, uh, to create fractions in the middle of the civilian uh, uh, um, coalition and in, 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 in the country as a whole, you know? And yeah. so the Sud- Sudanese television uh, for I think once in its life kind of had a brief breath of freedom where, you know, they were talking to activists and they were trying to like uh, gain back the people and it was, you know, and and after that visit, everything changed, and we went back again to the thirty-year propaganda of al-Bashir, calling everybody else a terrorist and calling everybody else a, a traitor. And they're dealing with the the communists, and they're dealing with this, and they're dealing with that. The same, you know, BS basically that 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 doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, back again in the street, you know, the last the last thing is they actually called ambassadors, sitting ambassadors of uh, Italy, uh, Holland, and England. Uh, as, as they're selling drugs in the city, mm-hmm. they're distributing. they distributing. They're distributing 16 tons of hash that could be in the water and also in the air. And this is what actually made people protest. So this is how, this is how naive they think people are, you know. And and and, you know, for me, like this 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 um, this uh, rise of Hamiti. Mm-hmm. And 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 backing Hamiti, not even backing Burhan, backing Hamiti mm-hmm. is um, is so typical of 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 how the Arab world even you know looks at us, you know, because we don't even deserve a CC or a Hafta. We deserve someone that that doesn't even you know didn't even finish school, doesn't even is not even proper military. We deserve someone that just has power, just you know give him give him weapons and just let him run wild. It doesn't matter, oh. you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, for me, it was it was it was kind of like the equivalent of a blackface when when they do it in the British, in the in the sorry in the in the Egyptian sitcoms. You know, th- this is how law they think of it, and this is this is really what happened. So it's uh, now people are, I'm very happy now because there's there's there the people are back, and you can tell uh, even though without internet, even though with very little communication, you know the the Association of Sudanese Professionals is doing an incredible job. Activists on the ground are doing an incredible job. And they're actually, you could tell that, that, you know, people were broken, people were shocked, but now they're kind of, they're back, they're back on, they're back on their feet. Mm-hmm. Not fully, but, but, you know, the hope is there at least. Uh, Bayan, you basically study this issue of anti-blackness, um, which Khaled alluded to from the, the Gulf countries and the Gulf coalition, which is backing the TMC. Um, can, can you explain like how, how exactly that happens and how it's played out in the past as well, in a way that, explains what's happening now yeah um and so i think that like sudan has always been puppeteered or like puppeted as um a sort of tool for different arab states to use to fulfill whatever desires they have in the region and i think we've seen that a lot with ahmed al-bashir's role because so much of it was founded on corruption and just like giving so many things up in sudan and so many things up within the country for whatever profit could be that, that could be made and i mean that it's best demonstrated by like this how in between the proxy where we were between um saudi qatar and iran and turkey and how like sudan had a foot in both sort of camps where you see Amr al-Bashir um, in the end of 2017 uh, greeting uh, Erdogan and giving him up, giving up a port in Sudan for their use, but at the same time giving this land to Saudi and while also like making um, deals for land for Qatar as well and promising the same deal where they get 99, they have a 99 year lease on some of them, like the richest and most fertile land in Sudan. Um, and so I think part of it is like a raging anti-blackness that exists all over the Arab world and that we're have where black people and particularly Sudanese people um have sort of just been considered like the other to the Arab world that is Arab but Arab, Arab enough to where like they were treated as such in formal settings and things but at the end of the day like we work in their favor um uh Eve Trout Powell writes a really great book uh she has a really great book called uh A Different Shade of Colonialism The Mastery of Sudan Egypt Great Britain and um Egypt Great, Egypt, Great Britain and it's in the Sudan, sorry, um, where she sort of talks about the, this, how Sudan has always been imagined, at least in the Egyptian imaginary, as being um, 
secondary to and working and existing only in the favor of Egypt. And I think that sort of understanding of Sudan um, is really persistent across the Arab world and is demonstrated heavily in like the way we're dealt with politically. Um, and I mean, it shows in the fact that MBS and MBZ gave it, promised $3 billion to Hemekdi and to Burhan, gave them all these weapons and basically said, destroy the sit-in. Like, we need your country. We need um, mercenaries coming from our rapid support forces to fight the proxy war, or the genocidal project, really, in Yemen. Um, so it's almost as if, as if we exist in this sort of imaginary of like a country with resources that they can use, but not really a country with people, with hopes and lives that they, they're fighting for. <clears throat> And of course, aside from the example you gave of all of the Gulf land grabs in Sudan, there's also the fact that um, Sudanese troops have been used to um, to wage the Saudi Emirati war <clears throat> and basically used as the cannon fodder and the foot soldiers and yeah. credible allegations of child soldiers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the New York Times did a really great profile on um, the influx of child soldiers, I think in last uh, last August, perhaps, um, of the 15, 14 year old boys regularly being taken to Saudi Arabia. And these are boys coming from Darfur, which was war torn by the rapid support forces themselves. So them being victims of violence that that sort of is the underpinning of the violence of, that's happening in the Ye in Yemen is just like it's, it's just a really tragic sort of genealogy of trauma and violence. Um, that is going to haunt the country for the rest of history because I, the things that we've got ourselves caught up in have just sort of enmeshed us further deeper or deeper into our own um, issues within the country. Um, so yeah, there's at least 30,000 soldiers as of today in Yemen um, fighting under the promise of money from Saudi Arabia and UAE. And they're literally, they're literally boys, like 14 and 15 year olds. And they're the same boys um, that were on the street in Khartoum. Like they're all just 14, 15, no, no one's older than 18 probably um, fighting these battles. Um, so, and yeah. you know the 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 other thing is that uh, that Bashir was of course trying to play all sides, and uh, it's said that one of one of why the the reason why he um, he agreed to the rapid support forces going to Yemen was trying to get rid of them, because they grew too big for their own power, right? Mm -hmm. And he couldn't control them, so just sending them over to Saudi will actually solve the problem. So then they go over to to Yemen will weaken them and so on. But what happened was it's, it made them stronger because of the money that was coming in uh, and support and, and weaponry and, and so on. And even, I, I guess, even practice that, that, they had in, uh, that they had in Yemen. So they outgrew him. So the, you know, the, the, I think the story of, of Hamiti coming to power is, is incredible. It's, 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 it's something I think that, that really should be studied. I mean, how this mm. person uh, you know, overtook his cousin, who was the lead, tribal leader of the Jinjaweed, and then to become uh, very close to power in Khartoum, to become basically the only uh, <coughs> the only protection for Omar al-Bashir, only to stab him in the back and become the next person in line now, or the first person in line, or the person that basically the the region is is is, is scared of right now to start another war in Sudan. You know, because he where is he going to go? How is he? Mm -hmm. Where? How is Sudan ever going to get rid of all these weapons that have been given to him? Also by the EU, mm -hmm. you know, because the EU mm -hmm. actually paid the RSF forces, uh, the the Jinjaweed, to halt down the 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 movement of refugees coming from Eritrea and from Ethiopia and even from Sudan. And when you give killers uh, money, uh, I can't remember what the process was called. Do you remember the bayan? Um, the Khartoum the Khartoum, the Khartoum, the Khartoum agreement. The Khartoum Agreement by the, by the EU. Uh, mm -hmm. So they, these people are loaded. They have a lot of money, and he also worked with the Russians, with the Chinese in in uh, in in, in uh, gold mines and so on around around Sudan. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 unbelievable how much this guy is connected, and he's connected to both. Again, just like Bashir was connected to the Saudis and the Qataris, both both the Axis, he's now connected to the Americans through the Saudis, and mm -hmm. he's connected to the Russians and the Chinese through the business uh, in 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 Sudan. So. Mm -hmm. I really can't foresee how we can overcome all of this without without this becoming a tragedy and a civil war. Yeah, it's incredibly ironic that um, they they went through this process, the Khartoum process or the Khartoum Agreement, in order to reduce the amount of refugee flows. Um, what they did was cynically pass um, money and what well, money that was used to buy arms to Hamedi, the leader of the, the Rapid Support Forces, who are basically the Jinjaweed from the Darfur uh, War. Um, this was meant to reduce the number of refugees crossing the Mediterranean to Europe. And a few steps down the line, what it looks like it could very possibly lead to is the complete breakage of Sudan into civil war um, and a disaster of epic proportions um, with like 
an order of magnitude more refugees leaving the country than what they were originally trying to stop. Exactly, and and create, creating another creating another refugee crisis for the for the Europeans again. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's the same short sightedness that keeps playing out again and again. Like it was done in Libya, where Italy has um, funded the um, the militias that have been warehousing migrants um, to stop them crossing the Mediterranean. Wow. And these these are the same militias who are fighting the civil war and preventing the country from developing uh, any kind of institutions to manage it. Um, it's the the same kind of thinking that decided to stay out of Syria because um, you know at least it's not affecting us until it was too late and it was affecting us. Um, and again, people see human rights as you know a romantic issue or idealistic, but it's not realistic for us to do right now. When in fact the the most effective way of dealing with these crises and transnational refugee flows is to uh, remove the causes of refugees, which is to remove the people making countries inhospitable and in uninhabitable uh, and impossible to live in with human dignity. Um, Absolutely. You've been um, writing a lot about the TMC and their moves. Uh, for people who don't have a background, Hamiti is the leader of the Rapid Support Forces, who are basically a rebranded ginger weed, who are the militias who were involved in Darfur war crimes in the mid 2000s. Um, he was elevated by Omar al-Bashir and his uh, uh, military group, the Rapid Support Forces, developed and spread across the country and is now a, a complete parallel military. Um, and he's become such a power broker that he's now a part of the Transitional Military Council that took power uh, after the overthrow of Omar al-Bashir. Um, and He's now promised an investigation into the massacre, uh, but he also looks like he's maneuvering himself um, for a run at direct power openly. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that and explain it, Hatem? Yeah. So basically what's happening is arguably since April 11th and more intensely post June 3rd, the TMC has been in a crisis of legitimacy. Because ultimately, the thing is that no government can rule through force alone. You also have to have ideology that makes people think, OK, you have the right to rule. So after the massacre, obviously, public opinion turned even more sour against the TMC. And Hemeti basically, un unlike the rest of the TMC, said, OK, I'm not going to talk about the massacre. So he started a series of speeches, mainly in, you know, outside of Khartoum, a lot of them to, you know, tribal leaders and tribal leaders and leaders of indigenous peoples within Sudan to just say, okay, I'm going to focus, we're going to rebuild the economy, we're going to, you know, get, provide electricity, we're going to provide clean water, we're going to provide education. So this is ultimately, you know, the type of bid for legitimacy that I think Hamiti has actually been working on since April 11th, when he first called for elections to be held in three to six months. Ultimately, what he's trying to do is whitewash his image and separate himself from the rest of the transitional military council. That's ultimately not going to make moves against him coming to power because he's so violent, because he's so, you know, trigger happy. So ultimately what Hamiti is trying to do is, for, he's already endeared himself to foreign powers. He already has the backing of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Now he's trying to endear himself to the Sudanese people. And every day on Sudanese television, we're seeing, you know, all of these groups, you know, profess their support for Hamiti. Like yesterday, they, they had a congregation of uh, women because, you know, obviously the Sudanese revolution has a little bit of a feminist bent, definitely focuses a lot on how we can empower women. It's one of the FFC's demands. And so they had this congregation of women basically, you know, talk up the RSF and talk up Hamiti and say that they would approve of Hamiti, you know, creating a government that a technocratic government that can tackle the economic issues of the country. Um, and, and what of the... Um, and then also, I think just to add, oh, if I can add really quickly on like the project that's been happening um, to help endear the Sudanese public, there's also this like the counter revolution is also taking stage on within Sudanese television, television as well, and like this rewriting of what the revolution was. Um, and there's this huge focus, even in international media, on this place called Colombia um, that was near the sit-in. Um, and Colombia was a place where, like, historically, drugs and alcohol were 
sold and like taken and just because it's right near the university. Um, and so then the counter revolutionary forces sort of latched onto it and as an idea and said, see, this revolution was like was led by like boys from the street and thugs and like people who just wanted to sell drugs and. It was a revolution of immoral activities and et cetera, Y and Z. Um, and so even in international media, you see them like propositioning, like, no, we were actually, we actually went to the sit-in to go take down Colombia. It wasn't at all, at all about the sit-in, which was um, less than a mile away or less than a couple of feet away actually then from, um, from Colombia. So his endearing project, it's sort of manifesting everywhere beyond the streets as well. So what we basically see is a, a CZ type scenario where he mm -hmm. took power violently through force and now he's just trying to put all the trimmings on top uh, in mm -hmm. order for him to legitimize his rule through some kind of sham elections or some kind of transitional process which names him as the head and then he can claim to be i don't know restoring democracy or something like that mm -hmm. uh, and it sounds like the real danger is that the international community will uh, allow this to happen and acquiesce rather than uh, rejecting it like they did when cc came to power in egypt when the obama administration basically uh, refused to actually classify it as a coup uh, in order that they didn't have to suspend their arms sales and their military aid. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how has the response been internationally to um, the attacks on the city and everything since? Because um, a lot of Western ambassadors have, had been visiting the city and meeting with the youth and meeting with the leaders of the protesters beforehand. Mm -hmm. It kind of alluded to the fact that um, they tried to defame them by claiming that they bought in tons of drugs and were dealing drugs yeah. by a country, which is again another thing that Gaddafi claimed. Um, uh, but how have people responded since in the international community, foreign governments? Um, yeah, so I think um, we saw like the usual outpour um, immediately after the massacre of like the United States Secretary of State and like the UK and the ambassador to the UK or the ambassador from the UK and from all over the Western world just saying we um, we really uh, we accuse the TMC of performing the attack on the sit-in and we request that the like full powers handed over civilian rule and there was this immediate like cry for help I think within the international community because so much attention had been paid to the to the sit-in right before that moment that I think it really caught on to international media um, although I mean for Suzanne we've never really been in the news to such a degree. So I think this is at the point of uh, like the most extreme case. Although it really like, I think uh, upsurge right after the, like after the blue movement happened. Um, but anyway, so um, immediately after you see the US, um, the US government like have a special envoy for Sudan since there wasn't one in place before, have him come to Sudan, have the Ethiopian prime minister come to Sudan, have so many people come and like try to negotiate with the TMC and with um, the freedom of forces and change and the alliances within, the, within that group. Um, but I think, I mean, until this point, I think they pretty, they've been pretty ineffective in that they haven't really changed what the TMC wants. They haven't changed their course of action because I don't think there's a, a reckoning with how deeply enmeshed the transitional military council is in global geopolitics and particularly with Saudi and, and the UAE. And given that, like Saudi and the UAE have so many of these Western governments and so many governments in general in their hands and in their pockets, it's not really going to be the Americans who are going to say like, listen, Saudi Arabia, we need you to stop enabling the TMC to fund your, your war in Yemen, which we are also funding, like, because we're also, like, the Americans and Western governments are really on the same side of the TMC on a lot of global issues. Um, and especially, like, after Hamethi and Burhan both vowed to stand with Saudi Arabia in its war with Iran, um, the Americans and I think Western governments in general are just not really inclined to really check their power. It's really going to be about how the TMC will serve their interests. And that's sort of why I think why they've been treading lightly, because they're trying to figure out what role the TMC will take and how much they're going to need to let them have maintain control to sustain whatever desires um, they want. Um, you mentioned um, these negotiations, this reconciliation process, and I heard that um, I think it was the government of Ethiopia which was sponsoring some kind of uh, uh, rapprochement or, or, or negotiations again between the forces of freedom of change, which is the body which uh, coordinates the protests, and the TMC. Hatim, you've been following that. Can you explain like when when that started, how successful it has been, what's what's happening with the prospect for some kind of negotiated answer? Yeah. So the Ethiopian mediation became began, you know, really, really shortly after the massacre, you know, Af the African Union suspended Sudan's membership, which is exactly what it did to Egypt after the massacre in Rabaa in 2013. Uh, the Ethiopian prime minister, he immediately came to Sudan and he, you know, tried to basically get the FFC and the TMC to go back to the negotiating table. That's 
I mean, I think that's the general line that people, especially in the the international community, especially in the region, is going to promote because nobody wants an unstable Sudan, especially in the region. This the type of war that would civil war that could result would be nothing like Sudan's ever seen before. Sudan's always had civil war, but it's always been like certain sections in the of the country. It's never been, you know, within the center. It's never been in the heart of Sudan. This would be that type of, you know, huge destructive revolution happening, in, you know, the most populated area in the country. So basically the Syria scenario. Yeah, basically. So obviously the African Union wants to promote negotiation. So the Ethiopian, we didn't really get that much, that many details about what was going on with the Ethiopian mediation. The FFC just made it clear that it wasn't going to directly negotiate with the TMC. It would let the Ethiopian mediation kind of guide indirect negotiations. I think this was a move made to appease revolutionaries who are wholly opposed to any sort of negotiation between the FFC and the TMC. And What's happened basically about yesterday is, you know, one of the FFC le- one of the FFC leaders announced that the Ethiopian mediation has basically proposed an agreement between the TMC and the FFC to resolve the issue over the transitional sovereign council, which would basically, which within the FFC's proposal is supposed to act as president. The main disagreement during negotiations, according to the TMC and the FFC was whether or not this council should have a civilian majority or a military majority. It was going to be a joint council. And the Ethiopian mediation has basically said that, okay, it'll be a civilian majority with seven civilians, seven members of the military, one more civilian who will be chosen by both the military and the forces of freedom of change. Mm. And then then there'll be a rotating president. So for the first year and a half, it'll be a military president. And then the next year and a half, it'll be a civilian president. And the FFC seems to be ready to accept this negotiation according to its leadership. And uh, is that representative of the people on the street or what's their their response being to that? Um, So I would probably divide. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I'd probably divide. Okay, I'd probably divide the people into two categories in this regards. The first camp, I would say, is the revolutionary fatigue camp. Ultimately, we have to remember is that Sudan is coming off of huge public trauma. The June 3rd massacre was horrible in every way. And because we're in the age of the internet, we have video of some of the horrors that resulted. So that camp of people is basically saying, okay, if we can get a deal going that can return stability to the country, that's good. And then we can, you know, basically hold the TMC accountable later once the civilians have gotten some power. The next camp is saying, don't be naive. The military transitional, the military transitional council, it's not going to hand over power in the next year and a half or three years. So we need to just, you know, continue protesting, continue revolution and refuse to accept any sort of deal that gives the TMC, you know, that basically codifies the TMC, which is what this current deal would do, because it allows these people to remain in power. And and that latter camp are having their way, right? Because uh, demonstrations have restarted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically. And I would argue that that camp, it tends to be the more passionate camp. They've always been present, even during negotiations that were kind of railing against the entire concept of negotiations and ultimately the FFC uh, acquiesces to them. They try to appeal to these people because these are the most passionate people. These are the people who are willing to, you know, put themselves in line, like, you know, in front of RSF bullets to for, for the country. I find that the revolutionary fatigue camp, from my experience, you know, based on like the conversations with the relatives I've had, they tend to be older and they tend to be people who aren't going out to protest. Yeah. I think that's a general sentiment, I think, like you really captured that well, that of being the general sentiment, I think, within homes. And like, that's the conversation that was being had over the dinner table of like, this country has been through a lot, like we need to like just give up. And like that, and I think after June 3rd, like one thing that I kept hearing was like, the FFC messed up that they should have taken the deal. And now look what we have. Um, but then like, I got into the streets and like looking at the reality of what Sudan has become with the rapid, the rapid support forces literally being everywhere all over Sudan searching people, stopping people, throwing bodies in the Nile. Like, I think there's no denying, like, the horror and the fear. Uh, 
of what they represented and what they could do while they had any sort of control, I think really haunted people. And so I think that the energy on the street and just in general really, um, so will sort of, um, I think enable the, the, the revolutionary, not the revolutionary fatigue camp, the one that's like the really impassioned group. Um, because I think just compromising with them and not, you know, after fighting for so long for civilian law government and giving up on that, I think just most people wouldn't really be for that because like the threat of violence is in our face every day. And so we know what we're encountering and we know like the horrors of what we're dealing with. And uh, we've mentioned the response of the international community. Um, there's, you know, condemnation, but lukewarm, like, and we're going to do anything about it. Um, and it's easy to condemn something when even the UAE, who sponsored the massacre, have managed to condemn it and call it a massacre, um, which mm -hmm. indicates that they're coming under pressure and they're embarrassed by it. Um, but uh, let's let's not underestimate the protests themselves and the protest organizers, because they have confounded every expectation until now so far. They've been more organized than anybody expected or predicted. Um, and I think they're going to continue to surprise people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Hatim, um, is there anything else that we should note about the, the revival of the protest or the, the TMC continued calls for negotiations, does that indicate kind of a, a fear of what might happen next if they don't come to the table? So, yeah, with the, with the current revival of the protests, you know, I think the main concern, first off, I think there's going to be some, there seems to be evidence of some FFC infighting. The Sudanese Professionals Association has always been a little bit more radical when it comes to the protests than the rest of the FFC. The, F, the rest of the FFC is a little more political, a little more pro-deal. And it seems to me like when I'm looking at like the, you know, based on what I can see from like, you know, social media, following the events, they're revolutionaries who are actually even promoting the F SPA, like seceding from the FFC and like, you know, rejecting any sort of deal. So that's one thing about the revival of the protests. The next thing about the revival of the protests that's important to note is, um, first off, it's just harder to organize them. So people are still working against the internet blackout and the internet was a huge part of keeping the protests organized and the next thing is that there actually haven't been that many reports of a violent response to the protest by the tmc because the tmc is probably trying to cool off a little bit from the international pressure um and i think one thing to note is that there's it's been put in the newspapers and it's general knowledge now that the internet won't be back for at least another three or four months um and to me like when i heard that that was a telltale sign that things are only about to get worse especially because um there's rumors that the only working internet connection in sudan will be closed to the general public so there will be a full internet blackout um because as of now there's like some certain points where the internet is accessible um and so I think that one thing that I think people who are outside of Sudan should really just keep note of is like, although like, things will be quiet for a while, given the fact that there is no internet in Sudan, um, the situation will be the same, if not worse, because the, the blackout is there for a reason and they don't want to, people to know what's happening on the inside. It is incredibly shocking that, you know, in 2019, uh, it's the 21st century and a state can still go North Korea and black out yeah. the internet for its entire population. Um, yeah. I want to ask you guys if you're seeing any um, worthwhile or useful or promising uh, initiatives to draw attention to what's happening uh, among the diaspora and anything that people watch you can get involved in, anything that's uh, effective? Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of the work that I've seen that's being done is coming from the Sudanese diaspora. And I think what's really interesting about the Sudanese diaspora, which Hatim can attest to, is that every state has its own little coalition of members um, and its own group and its own like organizing force. So I think for people within the United States, I think just getting in touch with the Sudanese um, diaspora within your city, which honestly, by just like looking through Twitter, is it's very easy to pinpoint. I think like that's where the organizing efforts are going to be made. And that's where most of the protests within the US are happening. Um, I think there's a number of accounts that I think people are really following. Uh, Yusra al-Baghir, who's a reporter on Channel 4, has been really useful. Um, Sad al-Hassan, who's an activist, a citizen journalist, I would also say, um, who her account handle is BS on Blast on Twitter and Instagram, has also been like a super informative source for Sudanese content since like before, way before the revolution. Um, 
And I think um, in general, like look toward, towards the diasporas to help lead back to the voices that are there in Sudan because they have the they have the best connection um, to everything that's going on on the ground. And then look towards them for information on protests and rallies and things. Uh, and of course, amplifying what's happening and uh, promoting the news and helping get it coverage and draw the world's attention like uh, you've been doing, Hatem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Try, try my best. It's really important, I think, in the end that people go to student news sources to find out what's going on about the conflict. A lot of people talk about, like, you know, why isn't Sudan being covered more? For me, the issue isn't really the amount of coverage, but it's the quality of the coverage. Mm -hmm. Looking at, you know, the type of basically the type of reports we're seeing but that are shallow, they're incredibly lazy reporting. Trevor Noah's mm -hmm. recent segment on The Daily Show about what happened in Sudan, just sad, exhibited no understanding of the conflict. And I think another thing that we have to be careful of is we have to remember the international community's role in legitimizing the TMC. And it's yeah. doing that by calling for more negotiations, by emboldening uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And that's the, really the difficult part. If you really, yeah. really want to help Sudan, pressure has to happen on Saudi Arabia and the TMC as well. Yeah. Because in the end, we have to re recognize the TMC is just the latest Saudi Arabian project to crush democracy in the region. Mm -hmm. And I think although like the support for Sudan and all the profile pictures and everybody on social media going blue has been really like for me, crazy to see just because I haven't seen Sudan covered that much. But then, like, once you get to understand that all people are posting is pray for Sudan and not really posting, like, the nuances of what's happening and the fact that, like, we don't really need prayers at this point. We need you to put pressure on your government. So we need you to put pressure on the UN and the ICC to demand, um, to stop enabling the TMC, to demand civilian-led government um, is really what we need. So I think just a depth, there should be more of a depth or a pursuit for depth of understanding of the conflict rather than just, like, coverage, as Hassan pointed to. Okay, I think we'll uh, call it a day here because it's been really informative. Um, and the video of this is going to be available on YouTube and on our website for people who didn't manage to catch the full thing. Um, and of course, we'll include links to your uh, Twitter handles, your Reddit page, Hatim, where you're keeping your timelines, and your Instagram, Bayan, um, so people can keep up to date and also catch um, the people you're shouting out and telling them to follow because there are a lot of great sources for the news and for information on Sudan on social media. Um, so thanks for tuning in, everyone. Um, and we'll include more details in the description when we post this. Thank you, Thank you for having me.